praise indeed that God is great. He is great. He is awesome in all that he is and in all that he does. Praise the Lord. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, thank you that you indeed are great. Dear God, thank you that your greatness is manifest throughout all creation, and it is manifest in the lives of your people through the reality of your grace that is poured out upon them. Thank you. Bless us this morning as we examine your word. We pray that as we do, Lord, your Holy Spirit would, as only he can do, would work effectually with it in our lives, further conforming us to the image of Christ. Thank you. In Jesus' name for your word. Amen. Open your Bibles with me to the book of Romans this morning and there to the 13th chapter. Romans 13. And in the text, move down with me to the last verse of Romans 13, verse 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. We have been taking some time to examine some very specific texts in Scripture, both in the Old and in the New. And this morning I would like us to begin, for the next few Sundays, an examination of this particular text. A simple verse, but not simplistic. Simple in that it is uncomplicated, it's clear, it's explicit. It's obvious what he is saying in the text. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. It's simple, but at the same time, it is powerful. And the depth of the verse reaches into the very core of every Christian and communicates to the heart of the inner man the words of God, the desire of God for God's people. So in that way, it is profoundly powerful. Simple, but profoundly powerful. And you know, it is an amazing thing that much of God's Word really is that way. God has not filled it with multiple compound words. Although there are compound words in it, most of the words in Scripture and all 66 books of the Bible are words that are given to us at least at one time on a very plain and apparent level. The Bible tells us that he gives wisdom and discernment to the simple through his word. So what a praise that is. But here we have one of those instances where the, par the words are simple, but powerful, profound, communicating to the very core of God's people his desire for them. I want us to take this morning and look at two truths regarding this verse. There are many here, and we'll see them, but at least two this morning. The first one is contained in the very first word of the verse, but. So first, we need to see that there is before us in this verse a contrast that is taking place. And then secondly, this morning, by the grace of God, we'll see that what is before us is not an option, but it is a command for God's people. Actually, two commands here. First, we recognize a contrast, then we recognize in this verse, command. 
take a look at the text again. But, but. That is a conjunction, if we want to get more technical about it, and it's a conjunction of contrast. So in order to see what the writer, what the Apostle Paul, and ultimately what God is communicating to us here, we have to back up in the text. Because he has set for us here in the first word a contrast. It is a contrast then to what? What is the contrast that is in view? Well, back up with me for a moment. Let's start in verse 13. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. So what has come just before this is a list of some kinds of sins. Not all specifically mentioned here in the details of each one of these, but generally in various categories. And so the contrast is to sinful behavior. To sinful behavior. What sinful behavior? He listed here. Not in carousing and drunkenness. Not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, not in strife and jealousy. Christians, our lives are to be different once we are saved, are to be different. Look at it again. Do not do these things in contrast to these things, in clear opposite direction. It's a contrast. Now, something very important about a contrast in this context is this, that there is another contrast that has taken place already. And to understand that, we're going to back up a little bit further in the text in just a moment. But first, I want you to recognize that one of the things that separates Christianity, there are many, but one in particular that separates Christianity from many of the religions of the world, many false religions, and all false religions really for that part, and from the cults, is that Christianity works, in a sense, if we can use that term, from the inside out. While false religions and the cults and the occult, they work from the outside in. As a matter of fact, that's no different than whenever you look at other places in Scripture, for instance, the Pharisees, their characteristic Belief and religion was working from the outside in. And Jesus captured that whenever he said to them that they were whitewashed tombs. Basically, he was communicating to them that they had cleaned up the outside, but on the inside, they were still full of dead man's bones. The coffin looked beautiful on the outside, but on the inside it was rotten. And that's the way false religions do. You clean up the outside and everything's going to be better and you'll be acceptable to God. And you know, indeed, it is possible that you can change the outside. The Bible communicates that as Peter wrote in one of his epistles. And he spoke in Second Peter about dogs returning to their vomit and pigs to their wallowing in the mire. He was talking in that context about the outside being reformed, but the inside was still deformed. It was still corrupt. There had been no change. There had been no difference. And it harkens clear back to the beginning immediately after the fall of Adam and Eve. 
You remember what they did when they heard or after they had initially sinned. First, they covered themselves. They're outside. They thought, hey, if we just cover up, we're okay. And then whenever they heard the voice of God in the garden, what did they do? They hid themselves. That's an amazing thing. They thought we'll hide from God. We'll cover ourselves up from him. And he won't see, or he, perhaps he'll accept us in some way. No, that's not the case. The inside needs the treatment. The inside needs the treatment. And so there is this contrast that is between <clears throat> what is Christian and what is false. God in this text, whenever he speaks here in Romans 13, 14, is addressing Christians. The whole context of Romans is set in the context of addressing those who are believers. You can see that by going back to Romans chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. And clearly, Paul identifies in Romans 1, 6 and 7, the audience to whom he's writing as Christians. As Christians. And in essence, the life of a Christian should be a contrast to the way they were before salvation. It should be a contrast to the way of the world. The world is living one way. God says to his people, you live the different way. The world is on one path to destruction that is wide. You are on another path that is narrow, and it is the path to life. One of the verses we read this morning said that we are to live such good lives among those who are unbelievers that they may see our good deeds and glorify God. Our lives should be different. They should be different. Look in this context again here in Romans 13 and back up with me for a moment to verse, let's. Go to verse 11. He has just mentioned that we are to love our neighbors. And he says in verse 11, Do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. I want to focus initially just on the latter half of that verse, and then we'll back up into verse 11. But notice he said there, salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. As I mentioned, he's writing to Christians. And you see that in that verse. He says salvation is nearer to us. Now, some come to this verse, and they look at that, and they think that, well, that means the second coming of Jesus and his reign. Not necessarily, no. Some come to it and look at it from the perspective of saying, now salvation is present, so you must believe. But look at it closely. He says, and again, salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. What is he talking about there? Whenever he says salvation and he's talking and he includes himself, he's talking to those who are already saved, and we verified that. And I mentioned the text to you in Romans chapter 1, verse 6. Jump back there for a moment with me and take a look at it so we can see that clearly. Romans 1, 6. Among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father 
and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes on to thank Jesus Christ for them in verse 8, for all of them. They are clearly Christians. They are clearly those who are saved. So what is in view here whenever Paul says salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed? Well, I believe that the best way to find that out is to look in the text. Look back even a few more chapters to chapter 8. Whenever Paul talks here about salvation being nearer to us than when we first believed, he's talking about something still yet in the future, but it is closer. It's in the future, but it's closer. It's nearer. It's closer to us now, this salvation is, than whenever we first believed, than when we were first saved. What salvation could it be speaking about? Well, notice here in Romans chapter 8, and move down in the text to verse 18. Again, Paul is still addressing Christians here. He started this chapter out by saying, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And he moves into this 18th verse, and he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory of that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. So you see in verse 18 that there is a glory that is to be revealed to us. You see in verse 19 that there is the revealing of the sons of God that is still to come because the creation is waiting eagerly for it. Verse 20 says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So you see in this that, again, there is a glory that is to be revealed to us in verse 18, that the Creation is longing for the revealing of the sons of God. The creation in verse 21 will be set free from its slavery, and that in to the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation in verse 22 groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. What he is saying is right up to this point, and not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. So you see this, this sequence happening here. Take a look at it again. Verse 18, there is a glory that is to be revealed to us. The entire creation is waiting eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. It is doing so because whenever that occurs, it will be set free, freedom, or into the freedom, in verse 21, of the glory of the children of God. And that is true in verse 22, Paul says, right up to the point that by the work of the Holy Spirit, he penned this verse. And not only this, he said, but also we ourselves, even we ourselves are groaning and waiting eagerly for our adoption. We are waiting for something, something still in the future. If you're waiting for something, then it hasn't come to completion yet. It may have started. It may be on its way, but there's something still to come. There's a future aspect of it yet to come waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption, and here it is, of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what, is already, what he already sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we, with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. So ultimately what's in view here is the redemption of the body. We refer to this as the glorification of the saints. That point in future time when we are fully, completely, 
in both spirit and body conform to the image of Jesus Christ. And he summarizes this a little bit later in this chapter. Take a look at it with me. Verse 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. That's what's in view. That's the glory to come. That's when we will be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's the good that God is causing all things to work together for in the lives of his people. God is about conforming those who are Christians to the image of Jesus Christ. They are already believers. As a matter of fact, in verse 30, and these he predestined, he also called, and these whom he called, he also justified, and these whom he justified, he also glorified. It's past tense in the sense of the words themselves, but they are conveying this reality that it will be done. It is, in one sense, as good as done because God has very specifically predestined it. He has, yes, predetermined it. And you can go on in this text and see that, but. Whenever we're talking in Romans 13, and I'll ask you to go back there, and verse 11, about salvation being nearer to us than when we first believed, we're talking about that salvation of glorification, the final outcome of salvation. Salvation, as we know, is past, it's present. And it is also future. It's past in the sense that it began at the moment God birthed a person into his kingdom and they consequently believed. It is present in the sense that God is at work right now, working all things together for good, as we read there in Romans 28 and Romans 29, Romans 8, 29, that good is conformity to the image of Jesus Christ. And salvation is yet future. We will be conformed. And that's what's in view here. Salvation is nearer than when we first believe. But remember, we're talking here about contrast. They're already saved. They have now a new nature. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 began, as you remember, we just mentioned it a moment ago, that there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 picks up on that idea of being in Christ. And it says, therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When God saves a person, he saves them from the inside out. He saves them from the inside out. He starts on the inside. He starts on the heart. He starts where the problem is. The major problem, the cause of the extremities. The cause of the problems on the outside. The heart, Jeremiah said, is deceitful and desperately wicked above all else. Who can know it? He starts on the inside and then works his way out. And that's where we're at here. The working of the way out. You are saved. This group is saved. And consequently, because they're saved... Their lives should be different. Look to verse 11, the first phrase. Do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. Awaken from sleep.
God's people are those who are no longer spiritually sleeping. They are no longer those who are in the condition where they are inactive regarding the things of God. They are in the condition of being awake. Whenever you're asleep, you're insensitive to the things around you, for the most part. You are inactive with regard to what you're doing. And Paul is communicating here, the Holy Spirit is, to the people of God, and that is that they are in a position of now having a new nature. They are no longer insensitive and indifferent to the things of God. They are now awake. That needs to be their character, because the condition of their heart has changed. They now have a new nature. Verse 12 says, The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. The Christian life is a life that is characterized by being awake to the things of God, not await to the things of the world. Aware of them, but not living by them. It is a contrast to what they have come from. Look in your Bibles from here with me for a moment to Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians 5, you're going to see it here as well. Actually, since we're in Ephesians, jump back over to chapter 2. Again, following the idea of a contrast, Ephesians 2, 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. I love this next phrase. Paul says, Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh. It's a contrast, and in that contrast, he includes himself. And he himself says that at some point in his life, before salvation, he was living a life in the lusts of his flesh. And Paul was a very religious man. His parents were very religious people. And whenever he was born, he was born, as he says, an Israelite of Israelites, a Hebrew of Hebrews, basically. And he was brought up in the idea and the truth with regard to the law. He was a very religious man. But even though he was religious, he was walking according to the lusts of his flesh. You see, he was pursuing his own religion and not God's truth. It looked clean on the outside. He was a Pharisee. But the condition and character of the Pharisees is that, as Jesus said, and we've already mentioned, the tomb looked pretty, but on the inside it was full of dead men's bones. Dead men's bones. Paul describes the dead man's bones here as walking and living according to the lusts of the flesh. Whenever you back up in verse 2, it says, in which you formerly walked, and notice this, according to the prince of the power of the air, or according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That is the devil himself. Where's the contrast? Look at verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us. That's right back to Romans chapter 8, where Paul says, who can separate us from the love of God? And there in that context, he's talking about all of God's elect. Those who are saved and those who are yet 
to be saved. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, dead in our transgressions, that's alive and awake to the things of the world, but asleep to the things of God. He says, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Contrast. Chapter 5. Move down in chapter 5 to verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness. You see that there? It's a contrast. This is the way you formerly were. And I love this because he's not saying you were just in darkness. He's not saying that you lived in the darkness of the world. That's true, you did. But he said there was a greater problem. You were darkness. You had a rotten heart. You, all people, were against God. All's throat, as Romans 3 said, is an open sepulchre. All of us had the poison of asp under our tongue. And on and on and on, he says, and notice, notice it again, you were formerly darkness, but now. Here's the contrast. But now. Now what? Now, since you have been birthed into the kingdom, now, since you have been raised up and made to sit together with Jesus Christ in heavenly places, hearkening back to Ephesians chapter 2, you've been raised up with Christ. That's the now. You're a Christian. It's a contrast to the way you were in condition. So, consequently, the condition being changed now the characteristic behavior should be different. It should be a contrast. Different nature, different character. Look as the text goes on. You are light in the Lord. Now this is what you were. You were darkness. Now you are light. You are light in the Lord. So what do you need to do? Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And we could go on and we could look at several other texts of Scripture that point out that God's people, because they are God's people, are to be living a life contrasted to the world around them, contrasting the way to the way they formerly were. Another text that comes to mind for a moment, turn there with me. Look at 1 Thessalonians. Go over just a little ways, and you can see it's very similar to what we're looking at there in Romans chapter 8, and again there in Ephesians chapter um, 5, actually it was Romans 13, and go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, 5, bear with me a second, I'm in the wrong book, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 5, for you are all sons of light. Your sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert, alert and sober. So Paul, writing to the Christians at Rome, says to him back in Romans 13, 
Verse 12, the night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. Our lives are to be different. They're to be a contrast. Because there is a contrast in condition. The condition being, you are a child of light. You have a new nature. Your life now should be different from the way it was. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Look there with me for a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And move down in that chapter to verse 14. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have, un have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters of mine, says the Lord Almighty. Whenever the Christian life begins at the point of regeneration, their lives now in condition are a contrast to the way they formerly were, and the result of that is their characteristic deeds should be a contrast to the way they formerly were. No exceptions. There should be a difference. It is amazing today how many so-called churches want to flip this all around and give the impression that Christians are just like everyone else in the world. So that they will come into the church, those who are not saved, those who are unbelievers, and see no little difference or no major difference. They want to act like and have programs like that are similar to what's going on in the world. And it doesn't surprise you then when you look at the individual Christians that they are much like the world and doing the things and involved in the things that the world is living like and in. Wearing their clothing like the world. Carousing like the world and with the world. And even those behaviors creeping into the church. And listen, they really don't even have to creep in today. They just show up and they're there. And not a lot of difference. You'll never find that an acceptable practice from the Word of God. There is first in this text of Romans 13, 14, that contrast. But, but, in contrast to the way you were, in contrast to the things that you did, but, and then he gives us the commands, two commands there. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Two commands. Put on and make. Put on and make. Both commands. Both imperative. That's significant. Because there's no options. 
put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Wear Him. And we'll look at the, the significance of that and the meaning of that verb put on in the future. But acknowledge that this is a command to the people of God. If you're a Christian, you don't have the option from Scripture to live like the world on one hand and live like Christ on the other. As a matter of fact, you can't find that in Scripture because they, those two things are absolutely antithetical to one another. And that's what Paul was communicating to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 that we read a moment ago. What fellowship has light with darkness? What agreement does the child of God have with the devil? What agreement does Christ have with the devil? The two things are in opposition to one another. They're in opposition to one another. You can't have both. It's impossible if you're a Christian. And if you're not a Christian, you can't have both either. In one case, in this context, you are, if you're a not a Christian, you're asleep to the things of God. Sleep being uh, synonymous with spiritual death. You're insensitive and indifferent to the things of God. The Word of God has no value in your life. Oh, you may have a Bible. You may read it occasionally. You may attend to church. But if your heart isn't changed, you're just changing the outside. And the inside's still full, in the words of our Lord, dead men's bones. You've got to be changed from the inside out. And if you're a Christian, you should be asleep, dead and indifferent and insensitive to the things of the world around you. That doesn't mean you're unsympathetic to the sinner. It doesn't mean you're indifferent to the person who's unsaved in the sense that you want to communicate the gospel to them, in the sense that you see their misery and you know the remedy is Christ. It's redemption. It's not recovery. A word so popular in churches today, put on their billboards, put in their, on their websites. We have a recovery program. Listen, God's got a redemption program. It's in Jesus Christ. You're redeemed from sin. You have a new nature. You have a new life in Christ. You have the power over the sin. You're set free from it. It's not recovery. And this text in Romans chapter 8, or excuse me, Romans 14, is not a text about recovery. It's a text about sanctification. You're saved, you're being saved, and you will be saved, so live like it today. Live like it today. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I love that. He doesn't say, just think about doing it. He doesn't say, pray about doing it. He doesn't say, you know, you really ought to consider this. No, he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a command. It's a command. And the second command, make no provision. Wear Christ because you've been changed. You have a new nature like Christ. Wear him. Put on the uniform of Christ. Put on the character of Christ because the condition of Christ exists in your heart, in your life as a Christian. And make no provision 
for the flesh in regard to its lusts. He's saying, starve it. Don't provide for it. Colossians 3 uses a little different word, and it says, mortify, therefore, or put to death your members that are upon the earth. Starve it. Don't think about doing that. Don't ask yourself, should I or shouldn't I? Do it. Their command. So we see here contrast, but. And then we see that contrast. Contrast to the former way of life. Because a condition has changed, which is a contrasting condition to the former condition that you had. You were dead in sin. You now are alive in Christ. So consequently, change the behavior. God saved you from the inside out. Do the things that he's called you to do. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh in regard to its lust. Don't be like the world. The world is pursuing headlong its pleasures. And it is amazing how many times today the church wants Christians to pursue pleasures. Listen, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh in regard to its lust. Let's stand this morning. Two commands in the context of a contrast of conditions. Two conditions. Condition are two contrasts, a condition change and a character change. Father, thank you for your word, the profound power and truth of it. I thank you that it effectually works in the lives of those who believe, it calls us and make us adorned with Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.